connecting. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Saturday for our Women Non-Binary Program, How to Bike the Gap Workshop. Um, I'm very excited to have our instructor here, Dirty Jones, um, joining us today. And before we get started, I have just a couple housekeeping items. Um, everyone is currently on mute just so we can keep the flow of the presentation going. But um, like you've seen on the sidebar here, we do have a chat function that is working as it should. So if you want to introduce yourself with your name, pronouns, and whether or not you have a gap trip planned or are looking to plan one this summer, um, that's a great way just so we can get, all get a feel for where we're at. And then we will have a Q&A session at the end. So think of your questions while Dirty is chatting. Um, and with that, we can get to it. So yeah, Dirty, it's over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you can be here. Um, I'm actually really excited to talk about The Gap. Uh, there is so much that we can talk about that uh, an hour is not enough, but I'm hoping to give you all a good overview. Um, I particularly wanted to focus on planning because um, The Gap is really a situation where you, should take the um, classic advice of ride your own ride. For as many people as there are in the world, there are that many ways to do it. And um, you shouldn't feel limited by doing, you know, to doing it the way that other folks have done it. Um, so to just get started, I think the two keys to a successful gap trip are one, good planning, because good planning will really like help, help you enjoy it, but the other key is things don't always go to plan and being able to be flexible and accept that there are gonna be things that go wrong and have backup plans to deal with them will make your trip that much more enjoyable. So um, just to start off with an overview of the trail, uh, the gap, um, when we talk about it, we're uh, actually usually talking about two trails, the Great Allegheny Passage, which is 148 and a half miles and runs from Pittsburgh to Cumberland. And then we're also talking about the CNO, uh, the Chesapeake and Ohio um, Trail, and that runs from Cumberland to DC and it's 184 and a half miles. So together the two of them make the Great Allegheny Passage Trail um, for a total of 333 miles. Um, so there are some differences between the two trails. I mean, we talk about it as one big trail, but there are differences. And knowing those differences can be really important in planning um, because, there are, because, because there are differences, you'll have to be prepared for like more than one style sometimes. So key, key differences are that, um, so the gap portion is crushed limestone. Um, it's a former rail trail and um, or former rail bed it's a rail trail and it's crushed limestone so it has a couple of things that are kind of advantages because of that the crushed limestone drains more quickly and um, because it's a former rail bed it is no more than a one or two percent grade now that compared to the cno um, that is a former canal towpath so it is packed dirt and so it doesn't drain as well. It can become very muddy and mucky and ruddy during the spring rainy season. Um, you're kind of gonna have your best riding there when it gets a little bit hotter and that dirt can dry out and get a little more solid. Also, being a former cano canal towpath, it, um, it's steeper than uh, the one to 2% grade that the gap is. And, um, that can make a difference. Um, that can influence your planning too, is the, the steepness. So other differences about them is the gap because it's a former, was built on a former rail line. It runs through a lot of private property. It runs through towns and it runs through like right up against farms, people's yards. It's private property uh, most of the way when you get off of the trail. Um, the CNO on the other hand is part of the National Park Service. Um, it was given a historic parks designation in an effort to preserve the um, parts of the canal. You'll see historic locks along there, historic aqueducts. Um, and that means it's administered by the federal government. Whereas the gap is mostly overseen by volunteers. Um, 
There is an overarching umbrella organization for the gap called the Great Allegheny Passage Conservancy. They changed their name. They used to be the Allegheny Trail Association, but they recently changed their name. So um, over under this umbrella organization, there are a lot of small volunteer organizations. When you're riding the trail, you'll see signs for them that indicate uh, like what small volunteer group is taking care of that segment. And in a lot of these little towns, they have volunteer groups who go out and they do the trimming of the weeds, they do the litter pickup, they, they just take care of the trail. Um, this can kind of make a difference even in response time. Um, there are times where if there's a tree down on the gap, Somebody who lives nearby and is a volunteer may have that pulled off before word even gets out. Whereas on the CNO, because it's uh, federally um, funded and is under the National Park Service, you're waiting for a parks employee to come out and get there. So it might not be until they're back in the office on Monday. Um, so there are differences that way too, just in how it's, uh, how it's taken care of. Um, but also that means there's a difference in the amenities that are on it. Because on the gap, you're on private property, there aren't as many of the free hiker and biker campgrounds. Um, on the gap portion, you're gonna be going through a lot of little towns. Um, there'll be private campgrounds, but there are only four of the like free hiker biker style campgrounds. Whereas on the gap or on the CNO, there's, had it here, 20, 31, I was gonna say 21, 31 of the free hiker biker camps. Um, but you're gonna, it, on the gap or on the CNO, it's a little, um, I don't wanna say more difficult, but a little more effort to get into a town. There's places on the gap where you will be going right through town. Um, CNO, you might have to get off the trail and make a little effort to be able to get into a town. So the amenities vary that way. Um, that also affects the water sources. All of these uh, hiker biker style campgrounds have free public water pumps. That means on the CNO, there's gonna be a lot more of them. Um, on the Gap, there's fewer, but you are going through more towns where you will be able to stop and um, resupply, including for hydration. So that's just to just kind of an overview of like the differences in the trail and how you're going to be um, having to be prepared for different, different situations on both of them. So I really, like I said, believe that planning is so key to this. And I think that one of the like best ways to plan is to like, ask yourself a lot of like really honest questions about what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you wanna do it. Um, and so just, just to like go over some of those, I think the first question you ask really is, why do you wanna do it? There are a ton of reasons that you might wanna do the gap. Um, there's people that do it purely for the physical challenge, uh, people that do it because it's like a slower vacation. Um, you know, you can have your friends and family around you all riding together at like a relaxed pace and actually get to spend one on one one on one time with them, as opposed to maybe other vacations where you're running from event to event or tourist, uh, tourist, touristy things. Um, on the other hand, this can be a great vacation to uh, get away from people. Maybe it's just you and a small group and you like just want to be away from people. This is a way to do it. Um, there are folks who it's about seeing nature um, because you are going to go through um, a lot of wooded rural areas that are very beautiful. And also um, history. Uh, like as I mentioned, the CNO has a lot of history, uh, historical sites. Um, a lot of the small towns that you can get to from the trail um, are very, very steeped in history. Um, and the same goes for the Gap. You're going to be seeing kind of a different sort of history there. Um, but even starting the Gap right in Homestead with the, uh, at the pump house, there is historical information there. Um, so the whole trail is steeped in it. 
And so you may, you may want to like consider that if it's a physical challenge that you're after, you're going to probably not a lot as much time as if it's a nature and historical trip. Um, so if that's the case, you're going to want to um, figure out which portions you want to see and kind of leads to the second question, which is distance. Uh, what distance do you want to go? And we most often talk about it like going end to end, but um, I can see in the comments, there's a lot of folks who are interested in smaller trips and that can be great too. You can do um, like section trips or you can do partial trips. And I kind of refer to those as two different things. Um, by sections, I mean, you don't have to start in Pittsburgh or DC. Um, my friend and I once chose to drive to Ohio Powell and do a one nighter where we rode to Myersdale, went to the Maple Festival and ate as many pancakes as we could, stayed overnight and then went back to uh, Ohio Powell and drove home. So you can plan sections like that. Um, you can also do partials where you start in Pittsburgh and you may choose to only go to Cumberland. Maybe you're concerned or not feeling up to doing the CNO and the dirt pack. So you just do the gap, Pittsburgh to Cumberland. Or um, Pittsburgh to Connellsville. That could be just like a three day weekend for you. Um, the train actually stops in, um, in Connellsville, the Amtrak, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, but it stops in Amtrak. You could take the train out of Pittsburgh on a Friday morning to Connellsville and then start riding back and be back by Sunday night. So there are like a lot of options and it's up to you. Um, and part of the, that those options are kind of the third question, which is the direction you wanna go. Um, I just mentioned a couple different ways that you could go. Um, and things to think about in those directions. So in, if you go Pittsburgh to DC, the, um, there are advantages to that and disadvantages, just like anything along here. And what is an advantage to one person might not be to another. So pluses for going from Pittsburgh to DC, um, as I mentioned, the gap is a one to 2% grade until around Cumberland where you hit the Eastern Continental Divide. And that is basically the, the geological high point where it divides what flows into the Gulf of Mexico and what flows into um, the Atlantic Ocean. So this is our Continental Divide. Maybe that's all the further you wanna go. But if you wanna go the whole way to DC, that means when you get to Cumberland, it's all downhill. <laughs> and because it's steeper, it's going to actually be times where you can coast or you can take it a little bit easy. Um, so if you're going DC to Pittsburgh, you have to remember then you would be climbing that. And it's not, I mean, it's not like climbing Rialto, but it is a steady climb. Um, if you're going Pittsburgh to DC, you have the opportunity to have a little DC vacation at the end. Um, some folks wanna do that, wanna have a, you know, arrive there so that they can have one or two nights where they can go to the museums, which I'm not sure if they've reopened yet, but all of the outdoor monuments, um, or maybe just seeing friends and family in, uh, in the DC area. So that's an advantage. Now, one of the downfalls means you have to figure out how to get back from DC to Pittsburgh at the end. And sometimes people, just want to be done when they're done. After you've ridden 333 miles, you might not want a DC vacation. You might not, you might want to just not even have a night in a hotel. You just want to get in your own bed. So that's one of the advantages to riding from DC to Pittsburgh. So you'll have that steeper climb at the beginning. And also to be honest, that one to 2% grade isn't enough of a grade to coast at all coming from Cumberland to Pittsburgh. You're gonna pedal, um, a lot, even though it's technically downhill, it's not steep enough to like really roll. So yeah, to come back that way, you're gonna be pedaling the whole way, but you get to sleep in your own bed that night. So you have to weigh those things for yourself and um, you know, see which, which suit you better. So 
in addition to distance and direction, um, you're going to want to think about the length of time because the distance and the time are going to, you know, play off of each other so much. Um, you want to think about how much time you want to take, how much you would just like, how much it's going to be fun for you to be out on the trail. Is five days um, fun for you and seven days kind of pushing it over your limit? That's a personal decision, but it's one to really think about. Um, the other thing is what kind of time can you spare? I mean, got to think about what you can get off of work, um, family obligations, uh, that sort of thing as far as, you know, calculating what time you can give up. I have a dog and I learned the hard way. I can only board him seven nights. So I know that I would have to plan my trip with that as my like the most nights I could um, be away. And when thinking about that, about thinking about the number of nights you can be away and the number of days, you wanna also account for travel days. Um, so if you're, uh, say you're doing it from DC back home to Pittsburgh, um, you'd wanna account for the day or so that you need to travel to DC, whether it's by train or by hiring a shuttle or having a friend take you, you'll, you'll want to account for that day in your planning. Um, you'll want to account for if you want a rest day on the trail. Um, you know, maybe you want to stay two nights in one place for tourist reasons, for physical reasons, any of those reasons. So are you going to build in a rest day? Um, are you going to need a day off when you return? If you get back at if you get off the train at 11 o'clock at night, are you gonna be ready to go back to work the next morning? Or do you need to like, you know, put a day in there for that too? So you wanna count those days when you're looking at the total days that you can be away and then calculate how many that you can be on the trail. So the length of time, I mean, it, you know, as we talked about, you can do sections and you can do segments. So um, you can plan a trip for as much or as little time as you have. Um, you have that, you know, you have that, those choices. It's up to you what you want to, to do with it. I'd say the average to do um, end to end is about five to seven days. That's going to give you roughly 45 to 60 miles a day average. Unfortunately, you can't divide it completely even because of um, where the amenities are along it. I mean, it's, you know, these towns aren't evenly spaced. The campgrounds aren't perfectly evenly spaced. So even then you might have, you know, a 40 mile day one day and a 62 mile day the next, just so that you can space yourself out for the amenities. But five to seven would get you um, 45 to 60 mile days. And that's what a lot of people um, do. On the extreme end, I know someone who did it in three days. Um, that's three consecutive centuries plus. That was purely physical challenge. They did not get to enjoy any of the scenery or the towns or any of that. They were, it, for them, it was, they had done it slowly before. So for this, it was just a personal challenge. I wouldn't recommend that for a first trip because you're not gonna get to see much on it. Um, and on the other hand, when I'm uh, at Golden Triangle Bike, where I um, work with people who are doing gap trips, I worked with a couple who took, it was nine or 10 days, which is on the long end. Um, and they wanted that because she was a history teacher and she wanted, time, she wanted short biking days because she wanted time to explore everything along the way. There were towns that, where she wanted two nights because she wanted to have a whole day in some of these towns. I mean, you're going through Harper's Ferry and um, towns like that. So they were fortunate enough to be able to take that kind of vacation. Um, they actually had a couple of days um, in DC planned too. So they were, they were fortunate enough to be able to and plan the trip that they wanted and get all of that history in. Um, that to me, I don't know if I would enjoy that. Like I said, you know, everybody kind of has their like 
limit, no matter how much you love being on the trail, there's like a point where you hit and you're like, I'm just ready to be home. And I think 10 days would be too much for me. But that's the beauty of this is being able to design your own. Um, you also wanna consider what time of year. We were actually talking about that at the beginning, how June is really nice. There are, yeah, things to consider as far as weather and amenities when you are planning. Um, so winter is kind of completely out. Uh, they shut down all the water pumps because of freezing pipes. And they actually close the doors on the Paw Paw Tunnel. Um, or no, the Big Savage Tunnel, I'm sorry. That is to protect the tunnel liner from freezing. So uh, that's, that's just like the trail is sh shut at that point. And um, they open it usually at the end of March, beginning of April every year. This year, there was still snow on the ground, so they didn't get it open until April 9th. Um, then the, and also the water pumps are usually turned on about mid-April and turned off like mm, maybe the first or second week of November. So you want to plan for that. And that's, that's hard because sometimes we have a beautiful April or um, the end of October, beginning of November are wonderful. Um, but you still got to be ready for that. So even if we like luck into some great weather, then it might not be the best time. Um, like I said, the parks service is going to be the ones turning on the water pumps in uh, on the CNO. So if they're pulled away by another emergency somewhere else in the park, they might not get them on. That's why they don't give an exact date. They just say middle of April. Actually, when I checked two days ago, their website still said that they weren't on, which is surprising because this is late for them. Um, but it's just something to be aware of for and what kind of why winter is off limits. Now, that doesn't mean you couldn't do day trips in the winter. Um, if you wanted to do like a one night um, and you could carry all your own water that would be fine, um, but you really want to be careful about depending on amenities during the winter. Um, spring is great. Um, spring and fall um, are great, but that's when all, you have to watch on the CNO for the really mucky trail. Um, that's why June is kind of, as we were talking earlier, really great because it's the trail, the CNO is starting to dry out, um, but you're not getting into the really, really hot uh, July and August. Um, September is really great. September is also very much like um, June where it's starting to dry out or well, at that point it's drying out and it's not getting wet yet, um, but you're getting past some of those really hot, humid days of July and August. But once again, that's a personal thing. If you love that hot, humid weather and um, that's your favorite for biking, that's great, do it. You might actually uh, have an advantage of not having as many people on the trail. So um, that, that could be a driver for why you would choose that. Um, the one thing to watch for in the fall too. Uh, so in the summer, you know, we get these unexpected rainstorms um, and they usually pass quickly and that's not a problem. In the fall, one thing that can be an issue, and it isn't every year, but some years, are the remnants of hurricanes that come kind of up the coast. And um, problem with them is one, a lot of times it's short notice, like did the storm break up enough or not? And it's kind of like, you don't know till it gets here if it's going to dissolve enough to just be a passing shower or if it's going to be one of those ones that kind of sits over us for a while and puts down lots of rain. And that's the other problem. Summer storms pass quickly. Those hurricane ones can sit and um, just really make you miserable. So that's one thing to watch out for in the fall. Um, unfortunately, there's just not a really good way to predict those. And like I said, it's sometimes right up until the storm gets here before you know. But um, that might be something that inspires you to stick more to spring and early summer. So those are all things to consider. Um, 
So one of the biggest, this, once you know like when you wanna go and how you wanna go and all of that, one of the biggest questions you need to answer is your travel style. Um, there are so many options for how you can do, uh, how you can do this. Um, are you a camper? Are you looking for um, self-booking uh, lodging at like B&Bs and motels along the way? Um, do you wanna do a combo of that? Do you wanna hand off the uh, trip planning and like booking lodging to a trip planning company? Um, those are all options. Uh, GTB that I mentioned I work at, that um, is one of the services that we offer. And so like that is, um, that is a possibility. There are other uh, trip planning services that are out there. Um, Wilderness Voyagers is based out of Ohio Pal, and they have a lot of different services, um, and they actually do guided trips. So if um, you know, whereas GTB only offers self-supported, um, so there's all kinds of options, and you can. Um, be from like completely independent to letting someone move your luggage from hotel to hotel so you don't have to carry anything. So that's gonna be like, you're gonna wanna consider your budget, what you enjoy, what you wanna get out of the trip. Um, and that not, not, doesn't only go for lodging, but also for food. Um, if you're camping, are you gonna cook all your own food? Do you wanna do a combo where you, cook dinner at camp and cook breakfast at camp, but maybe treat yourself to lunch in one of these small towns um, where you don't have to worry about cooking, uh, you're putting some money into the trail economy and it um, maybe saves you a little time that you don't have to stop and dig everything out of your bag. So you will want to weigh those options. What, what style are you? If you know that you do not enjoy camp cooking, maybe you, you like the camp but don't like the camp cook, um, you go strictly with pre-made food and restaurants. Um, but you wanna you know, really like be honest with yourself about what you enjoy and what you don't enjoy. And um, think about that because if you don't enjoy a part of it, you shouldn't do it just because it's kind of the like way people, other people do it. Um, you don't, you don't have to do anything that other people do or don't do. Um, you should just choose the things that will help you enjoy the trip. Um, and also for travel style and budget, um, you wanna think about ground support or ground transportation. Um, how are you gonna get back or how are you gonna get to your starting point? Um, do you have family and friends that would be willing to drop you off? Um, are you going to use the train? Do you want to hire a shuttle? Um, you know, sometimes that is the only thing people need from a trip planning service is help uh, booking a shuttle to get back. Um, and, you know, got to think about whether that is something you're interested in. And um, there's, like I said, there's a lot of ways that you can do this. And one other one is that, um, you know, I talk about the trip planning services and all the things they offer. There are ways that you can do that without, um, where you can have support like that, that without necessarily hiring them, depending on what your friends and family are interested in. Um, I have worked with folks who basically had their own sag wagon because someone in their group didn't want a bike, but they were a hiker. So they would drive from, the, the hiker would drive from hotel to hotel and then check in, leave all the stuff and go out on a different day hike every day along the trip. And the bikers then didn't have to carry anything and they could show up at the motel or bed and breakfast and know that they like everything was taken care of for them. So the limits are, you know, it's only limited by your imagination. There um, are so many ways that, you know, you can come up with what works for you by like knowing yourself and knowing what, um, what you really want out of this trip. And then finally, um, bike gear is kind of an important thing to think about. Um, 
when you're planning your trip. What bike will you use? Um, I highly recommend that you don't have anything that is one extreme or the other, um, especially in regards to tire size. Uh, you don't wanna go anything too skinny. Um, on the Gap, 28 is probably fine, but once you get on the CNO, you don't wanna be anything less than like 32. Um, but on the other hand, you don't wanna do fat bikes or mountain bikes with full suspension. A hybrid with a little front end suspension that you can lock out is a great choice because you can turn it on in a bumpy area um, and turn it off in the paved areas, but um, you don't want a full mountain bike, especially not a full suspension because all the energy that you're exerting this way takes away from the energy that you're using this way. So it's going to exhaust you more um, to have uh, yes, I'm sorry, 28, um, 28 or 32, I meant um, millimeters, like your tire width. Um, I didn't mean to shorthand that, but yeah, so you're going to be, uh, don't really want to go through lower than the 32 millimeter um, tire width. Uh, so like no racing skinnies or anything like that. Um, but yeah, anything like hybrid, or touring bike that kind of falls in the middle is going to be really good. Um, and those bikes are going to be better anyways because they're more likely to have the ability to add a rack. And you probably um, want to uh, use racks. Um, if you're using a backpack, I mean, a small day pack to keep a few things handy is one thing, but if you're carrying everything you need on your back, once again, you're going to exhaust yourself. That's you're already putting a lot of um, pressure on your hands and wrists, and adding that backpack is going to add a lot more. Um, so you don't want to carry everything you need for a few nights in um, in a backpack. Um, so yes, I do mostly recommend um, a bike where you can fit racks on it, and then use panniers. Um, usually the back bike back racks, um, are going to, uh, hold a little bit more. Um, and those racks also allow you to anchor things to the top. Um, and that gives you a little bit more room too. on my bike. My tent fits on the top of my rack and I just bungee it. So it doesn't take up room in my pannier. So that's what. Back racks are gonna allow you to maximize your space. I actually brought a couple of my panniers up to show you. Now, most of us are used to the classic Ort leaves and they're great, but if you're doing the gap, you might be want to consider a soft-sided one because they pack better. Um, can't remember the brand name on this one, but if you notice, it doesn't have the hard uh, plastic hardware that the Oort leaves do. So you can actually stuff it pretty full. Um, and unfortunately, some of this stuff is expensive and you, it can be hard to um, know what you're gonna like before you buy it. So I do recommend that um, if you can borrow gear um, from a friend to try it out, that is a great way to um, figure out what gear it is that you like and what you don't like. Um, renting a bike is an option. That's one of those things that the different trip planning services offer. And sometimes even if you love your bike, that's an option because then you don't have to worry about cleaning it. You don't have to worry about the maintenance. You know that it is um, ready when you, when you uh, pick it up and when you return it, somebody else has to take care of cleaning it and doing the post maintenance. So um, that can be uh, an option. Also, you want to look at what gear crosses over from other um, from other outdoor hobbies you have. Uh, do you camp? Um, do you backpack? Uh, do you have friends that do those? Um, a lot of things from backpacking will transfer to bike packing. Um, so, if you already do those hobbies or if you have friends that do those hobbies, um, 
they might be a way to borrow um, equipment or try out equipment that you might not have initially thought like that is that is something I would want, but um, there is a lot of crossover between those hobbies. Um, so we already started talking a little, so that's kind of the questions you wanna ask yourself and they're all interconnected. Um, and like I said, they require you to think of your own personal situation. What, what is your budget? What are you interested in? Um, what are your time constraints? And um, so like you can start out with this trip in mind that is everything you could possibly want. But when you start applying these questions, you can whittle it down and figure out, is that what you want? Is that something I have time for? And if not, how can I adjust the time to achieve what it is that I want out of this trip? And so that's a way that you can really personalize um, what you um, personalize your trip. Um, now, as far as trip planning um, and other just general things, this is uh, getting a glare. This is a guide that's put out by the um, the Gap Conservancy, but it covers both things. It's about ten dollars. Uh, they put it out every year. So this actually says the 16th edition. There is a 17th edition, I believe, that's ready, but I didn't see anyone anywhere around. They're available. Uh, you can order them from the association. They're available at some local bike shops. I know like. The visitor center in West Newton always has all of like the things that the Gap uh, Conservancy puts out. That is a great resource. Um, but this is just something that you can pick up that might help you plan. Um, it, it has um, actually some sample itineraries in it. And um, that can be a way to plan your own trip. If you read an itinerary, that is interesting to you, but isn't quite, it gives you a good jumping off point and then you adjust it to make it for you. Um, also nice is this trail guide comes with a map that is the gap on one side and the CNO on the other. So that can be helpful. And um, it has uh, a little bit about the different, uh, each of the different towns that you pass through. Um, the, a word of caution about that, most of the businesses along the trail are small businesses. They're family run, they're independent. Um, so they don't always have um, a huge staff to pull from or anything like that. So you wanna check in and make sure um, they're still open, particularly after this year uh, with the pandemic. I know a few of the small businesses didn't make it along the trail. so. You want to check in for the latest information and you kind of always want to have a backup plan. Um, I mean, if it's a small business, it's just run by a little family and they have an emergency and have to shut, you know, the restaurant down for the afternoon. Um, you want to, you know, have a backup plan in case that happens. So maybe it's that you know where there's a second restaurant in that town or you know where there is a convenience store to get additional snacks so that you can make it to the another town and another restaurant. So um, this can be handy for giving you an over, like an overview or some idea of the places where you could stop, but you do still want to check in on them. And honestly, the folks along the trail that run these businesses, they are really encouraging of the whole, um, the whole, whole thing. It's, you know, mostly been a net plus from them. A lot of these towns were economically depressed, especially in the gap portion after the like fall of coal and steel. And this is a real opportunity for them to, you know, have something else in the town. Um, and part of the key to that is, you know, be, uh, is that all the guests being respectful. And so, um, and being appreciative. So I really like, feel like we do have to remember to like appreciate the folks along the trail. Um, so packing, um, we talked a little bit, I talked a little bit about that and I'm not gonna go into too much detail. We could talk 
details on packing and camping for days, <laughs> um, but we don't want to go that far. So um, just things, some packing things. Um, oh, we talked about panniers and racks trailers um some folks are really interested in using like a little bob trailer um this can be um a little bit difficult they um don't always do great on the cno if it's real mucky um and they do add a lot of weight i don't recommend that people use trailers unless you're traveling with someone who can't can't haul any of their own gear if you have someone who's limited physically where they can't, or sometimes if you have little kids, um, you just can't get anything on those little kid bikes, even if the kid's strong enough. Um, so in those cases, you may want to consider a trailer, but um, for most of the time, I recommend skipping that. Um, you don't want to overpack, but you don't want to obsess either. Um, I, I do not get into the whole idea of like, knowing your pack weight down to the exact ounce, um, but you definitely just wanna keep it reasonable. If you're camping, your camp gear is going to um, be a place where weight really adds up. So if you're camping in a group, you or you know if you're traveling in a group, you want to um, compare packing lists, you might not need um, to each bring one of everything. Um, say you have a group of six, maybe you only need two camp stoves to be able to cook for all six people and you don't need all six of you carrying those. Um, if you're traveling in a, a group of four, um, you know, you may only um, need two two-person tents and then you can split the tents between two people so everybody's carrying a half tent and so that helps. Um, so yeah, you wanna compare packing lists if you're traveling together. Um, so water, actually water is so important on the trail is probably like I feel like water and food being like the most important things. Um, as I mentioned, there are public, uh, public water pumps um, and there are times where those are shut off. Uh, actually, on the websites that are, um, I shared a Google Doc that Sarah's going to post in the chat. Um, on the websites for the Gap and the CNO, they actually list what mileage point each of those are at. So that can help you plan. Um, however, do not push yourself um, if you're running low. One of those pumps could be out, it could be broken. Um, that happens. I mean, they're kind of a simple machine, but that happens. So if you're getting low, stop and get more. Um, you don't want to run and you know back yourself into a corner, or run into a situation where you let yourself get low, you skipped one, and then the next one's broken. Um, because then you're trying to figure out if it's faster to go back or forward and how to get it. So just don't let yourself run that low. Um, As far as the water safety, uh, if you would like to filter, um, and a lot of people do, one of the lightest ways that you can uh, filter the water is with the UV stick. Um, I meant to have one here um, and didn't, but it's the battery powered UV stick that doesn't filter out the chunks, but it filters out the bacteria and um, uh, those sorts of things. Um, on the other hand, I don't know, I haven't met anyone who has reported an illness from the water and the National Park Service does um, test the CNO pumps regularly for safety. Um, the ones on the gap, it's gonna be up to the individual camps. And so that's, their schedule for testing might not be as regular, um, but those are always an option. Um, Additionally, um, if you, this is kind of just back to the small mom and pop stores, you want to carry cash and card. Um, just kind of thought about this. If you need to buy my buy water in a town or buy a Gatorade or something like that, um, it's good to have both cash and a card. In some of these small stores, you may run a, um, 
into a cash only situation. So that's important to, um, to have both. Uh, I also mentioned food. We talked a little bit about that. If you're gonna wanna decide if you are a camp cook or if you're a restaurant eater or if it's some combination, um, if you do wanna do uh, camp cooking, this is where backpacking and bikepacking forums are um, handy. Um, there are so many options and it's so many different price points. Um, like I said, we could talk about that for a day in itself, but those are going to be good resources that transfers. That's a place where backpacking transfers well to bikepacking. Um, I did pull one of my favorites out of the cabinet. This is something that I got from backpacking um, is the Tasty Bite. This is a great option. Um, it's a little bit more the expensive than convenience food that you um, would get in a grocery store, but it's less expensive than the convenience food that you would get that is branded in marketing towards backpacking. And I think it's actually tastes better than most of those dehydrated meals for backpacking. Um, and it's very versatile. Um, if you're in a hotel or a motel, you can throw it in the microwave. Um, you can pour it into a pan and heat it up over your cook stove. And I mean, if you're really feeling it, you can pull it open and eat it right now. <laughs> so that's just my personal favorite. I thought I'd share. Um, snacks, you want to make sure you have snacks. Um, you, you know, do not want to get into a place where you're low calorie, um, feeling depleted and you still have, you know, a town to go to. And you're going to want to just have your, the usual snacks that you would bike with, um, bars, nuts. Of course, it's going to depend on your personal diet, but those types of things that you see for any kind of trail riding. Um, so you're going to want to pack your bike kit and um, the things that you're going to want to have there are multi-tool, handheld pump, hatch kit, and a spare tube, tire levers, gloves, lights, locks, and um, I always like to have a rag and some rubber gloves because you got to pull your bike apart, especially if the trail's mucky. Just be able to keep your hands clean, wipe things down. A um, couple of things about that list. The reason I recommend having a patch kit and a tube is if you are um, if you are uh, on the trail and you flat, you might want to just throw the tube on and worry about patching later because you might be using up your daylight. I mean, in June, that's probably not as much of a problem where you have the like maximum daylight, but you know, the later in the summer and the shorter of the days. Um, it, you're going to save yourself time that way. Um, and it's just easier to patch when you're not under pressure. <laughs> so yeah, just have that tube and then you can, you know, save your patch one um, for when you, you know, put it in your bag and save, save it as your backup. Lights. Um, technically the trails are uh, dawn to dusk. And um, so that's just, legally when you're supposed to be riding on them and you're not supposed to ride at night. Lights are lights are still needed for the tunnels. Um, two particularly long tunnels are uh, Big Savage and the Paw Paw. And um, you will want lights in there. Um, your eyes do adjust somewhat. These tunnels are really long and you do need lights for those. Um, Locks. I still recommend a lock. Um, trail, you know, crime along the trail is really low. Um, you know, a lot of other riders are really respectful, but that's not helpful if you happen to be the one person who gets their bike stolen. So I do recommend it. And also, you're not always going to be on the trail. If you stop in a town, you're going to want to be able to lock up outside a restaurant. Um, so yeah, you do want you do want to have a lock. Um, even when you're, if you're camping, I, um, I lock up, I sleep pretty soundly. I don't know if I would hear someone taking my bike. Sometimes at a camp, I'm only able to wheel lock. Um, and hopefully I would hear someone trying to carry my bike away. Um, 
but sometimes I choose that because I don't want to damage a tree. So if you're camping and you can like, uh, you know, lock to a tree without damaging the tree, that's one thing. But I like sometimes choose to will lock so that I'm not damaging nature. Because it is like any other camping where you want to leave no trace. Um, oh, and you want to have your hand pump, but a lot of places along the trail, even places you wouldn't expect, are going to have floor pumps just because they're so used to there being so much uh, traffic. Um, one thing I do recommend is this tiny little cap. It is a valve cap that is a Presta to Schrader converter. Um, you just can leave it on there all the time. And if you need to um, use it, you pop it off, open your valve and pop it back on. The reason I recommend this is a lot of times, you know, um, like I said, people are great along the trail and they're doing what they can to cater to bikers. But, you know, sometimes they'll have a floor pump that's only a Schrader and you're, you have a Presta. So these are about a dollar and they can save you so much so much time and hassle on the trail that they are definitely worth a dollar and just leaving it on your bike all the time is really handy. And then just real quick, first aid kit. I feel like everyone should travel with one all the time anyway, even around town I have one. There are things you're gonna wanna have that are different because you are out in nature and you are gone all day. So there are things that you would maybe do to take care of yourself when you get home and you gotta remember to carry those with you. So um, a longer distance travel kit, you want to consider adding things like aloe and sunburn or sunburn treatment. Um, hydrocortisone cream for rashes, bug bites, um, you know, maybe you carry a small one anyway, but you might want to con uh, consider more. Um, Andy ointment for chafing and a uh, tick key or tweezers. Um, and maybe also a small vial or plastic bag to save that if you wanna send it for testing. Um, you are going through a high tick area. So those are things you might not carry in your daily first aid kit, but you do wanna have them on a longer distance trip. Um, As far as the uh, chafing issue I mentioned, another thing I'd like to mention there is to maybe not make a big change um, in your riding clothing. If you are a bike short person, keep using bike shorts. If you're not, don't decide that you're just gonna start doing hundreds of miles with them without trying them out. Um, that is like my number one recommendation, recommendation for avoiding chafing. Um, so I feel like that covers is an overview. Like I said, we could go on for days, but I feel like that could give you a good base and that maybe now we can go to some questions. Let's see. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dirty. I feel like the first question I saw was posed by Jen in the comments. Are e-bikes allowed on the trails? I have a cargo e-bike and was thinking, um, that could be their main packing bike? That is a great question. And actually, yes, um, cargo or e-bikes are allowed on the trails. Um, I think they can be a great tool uh, for, um, you know, people who have different physical abilities. They can be a great tool for families. Like I said, kids, um, it's not always easy to like pack all of their stuff. So I feel like e-bikes can be a great tool and they are allowed. There has been some debate on the CNO um, with it being a National Park Service uh, park, um, whether you know they will always be allowed, that it's still under debate there. Um, the preference is for the pedal assist style e-bike. Um, I think we're seeing a real wide range of e-bikes come out. Pedal assist kind of being the, the, the gold standard. And now you're seeing like, companies that don't even make bikes who are getting into the e-bike game and it comes out as something that's more like uh more like a tiny motorcycle and those are like probably not the ones that you want to have out there um those are probably the ones that eventually there will be you know bans on but um at this point they're still allowed and like i said pedal assist is the 
is the gold standard. So, okay. There are a couple more here. Um, looks like Paula asked, is it safe for a woman to travel solo? I say yes, but unfortunately, I feel like that's the answer everywhere in the world. Yes, but. Um, yes, but there are still dangers. Um, yes, I've done it. Um, yes, I've worked with uh, other women who have done it. Um, you really uh, have to just kind of apply the rules that we unfortunately have to apply so, where, so much else in the world, which is uh, being aware of your surroundings. Um, you know, and I know that we should be, shouldn't have to be the ones that are responsible for that. Um, but uh, unfortunately we are, um, but yeah, it, it's, I know many women that have, and I know, as I said, said before, when I was talking about bike theft, the crime rate is low and that is all forms of crime along the trail. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, there are always dangers. And if you decide that it's solo trip is not for you, that is okay too. Um, you know, that your own personal comfort level really comes into play there. Yeah, I would 100% second that it comes down to personal comfort level. There's no, I think one answer to that question for that reason, because that's really what it depends on is what you feel safe and comfortable doing. Yeah. Um, with that, I know there are tons of resources out there for women who are looking to travel solo, like whether it be by bike, hiking. Um, so I'm sure there are tons of great resources out there if you're interested um, that might help you make that decision. Our next question is from Kate. What's the bathroom situation like? What basic skill set should we be comfortable with before we go? Um, the bathroom situation actually is going to, um, most commonly you're gonna find bathrooms where you find water sources. So if you um, look at that list of water pumps um, on, the, on the trail websites that are on the um, attachment, uh, most all of those are at a hiker biker style camp. Um, so you're going to have bathrooms there. Um, they may be porta johns they may be chemical toilets, you may not be seeing like a full plumbed bathroom, but those will be where there are facilities. I do uh, recommend carrying um, some toilet paper and hand sanitizer. Um, I basically have what I call my bathroom kit that I take on all manner of outdoor um, adventures that it basically is just a uh, a pouch that has some toilet paper and some hand sanitizer. Most of the time they will be stocked with it, but that is a thing that people steal. And so you have to be prepared um, for that. And honestly, if you have that, um, it can help you out in a jam if you have to go behind a tree, <laughs> which is not ideal, but you know, sometimes it happens. But yeah, anytime that you're in a town, you'll be able to find um, bathrooms and anywhere, almost anywhere where there is a water source, that's going to be a, a bathroom source too. So, and um, as far as what um, skill set, um, I'm not sure about that question. Is it like, as far as bike maintenance skill set? Um, I, would recommend like definitely being able to change a tire, um, being able to uh, put your chain back on. Um, trying to think, I I mean those to me are like big ones. Um, yeah, I would say definitely chain and tire. Those are the biggest ones that I've heard people um, wishing that they had taught themselves or learned how to do before they rode to DC. Um, I know Megan here posed the question, how do you recommend learning basic bike maintenance, YouTube, or do you know any local workshops? Um, I want to shout out to Freeride. 
by co-op in the East End. They have women queer open shop nights on Tuesdays and Saturdays. So that is a fantastic way to learn. Um, Katie Blackburn, the president of Freeride, also just taught a virtual workshop with us. And we will be hosting another one on how to fix flat in July. So we have a few of those coming up, but definitely for in-person, I'd, I'd check out Freeride. Yes, that would be my recommendation entirely. <laughs> Um, Mary asked, what are the different types of shoes you recommend? Should I invest in a pair of cycling shoes? I don't necessarily think that you need to. I think that the best shoes for riding are the ones that you're going to be comfortable in. Um, that's, it's, that's a personal decision. Um, I, I don't clip in, I ride flat pedals and I, most frequently wear mountain bike shoes, even when I'm riding my road bike. Um, I feel like the boxy toe is what's most comfortable for me. Um, so that is what I choose. Um, that's gonna be totally up to you. It's not a requirement. Um, like I said, you're the, these are not like big climbs where you're gonna have to have like, clipped in cycle shoes and like just the, you know, like I said, you're not going up Rialto. Um, so you, you know, don't necessarily need that specialized gear unless that is what you were comfortable with. And I actually will add that like when you're packing, um, like I said, you don't want to go overweight, but you want to do the things that make you comfortable. Socks are my comfort item. <laughs> I want a clean, dry pair every day, plus one, just in case something happens. That's totally, again, an individual thing, but that's, that's my comfort item, clean, dry socks. I can do <laughs> nothing <laughs> kind of, I mean, there are things that are worse, but that is most definitely up there. <laughs> yeah. I'll rewear um, the same shirt for a week, but give me new socks and I am so happy. <laughs> yep, I'm there with you. <laughs> um, any recommendations for ride plus overnight trips or weekend excursions on the trail that would be a good indicator of a longer trip? New to trail and have camping gear so want to test or practice a few times. Yeah, um, I recommend a shakedown trip for everyone um, before you do this. Even if you're staying, if even if you're not camping, if you're staying in. Um, motels or BNBs, you still want to figure out how well your stuff packs on your bike. So I recommend practice trips for everyone. Um, you know, if you are doing that, you might only want to do a day trip. If you are going to camp, you're going to want to overnight uh, for practice. There is nothing worse than getting out there and finding out there is a problem with your gear at the start of a week long trip. Um, whereas if you're only out for a night or two, it's much more manageable and lets you um, let you, you know, get the practice. And then if you need to replace something or change up something. So trips that I would recommend. Um, so real simple trip is to, well, not right now, we'll get to that. But a real simple trip is um, Dravo. Sorry, uh, is Dravo Campground. Um, it is a campground about six miles past the Boston Trailhead. Um, it's free. It was actually, it's actually, there was a small town there that isn't there anymore, or a church and a cemetery. The cemetery is still there. The campground was built by Boy Scouts uh, as part of a service project. Um, it's a great little camp, but they have a raccoon problem. <laughs> The raccoons run the place and um, I didn't believe it until they messed with me. I've had friends that told me that they had stuff stolen, that these raccoons know how to open panniers. And I thought it was tall tales. It wasn't, um, you know, if people I know have had things like their water filtration system stolen by raccoons. Last time I stayed there, my friend, um, I was in my solo tent and they were in theirs and um, they heard noises at night and looked out and saw a raccoon trying to dig underneath my rain fly. <laughs> so the raccoons are in charge out there. Um, if that doesn't bother you, 
that's fine. Um, it is a great little camp. Um, picnic tables, fire rings. There's actually even a lean-to there. Chemical toilets. So it's a decent camp. And it's about 25 to 27 miles from the point. So it can be like a good short little turnaround. You could leave in the afternoon, be back by lunch the next morning. Um, I would actually recommend if you are not into sharing um, space with the raccoons is to keep on going down to Cedar Creek. That's closer to West Newton. Um, that is also a great facility. Um, it's a little busier than Dravo. Um, Dravo is not accessible by cars at all. So you are only gonna see hikers and bikers at Dravo. Uh, Cedar Creek is a little bit busier. Um, but a good tip about Cedar Creek is that some of the pizza shops in West Newton will deliver pizza there. <laughs> so if you can get a cell, if you can get cell service, you can get a hot meal delivered. Um, so that can be like a fun weekend trip that way. Um, Connellsville is also an option. Um, I mentioned that one earlier because the train stops in Connellsville. So you could take the train out of Pittsburgh and uh, ride it to Connellsville, get off there and ride back. And you could do that in, make that a two night, a two night trip and that would be good for a little weekend excursion to get some some practice in. Um, Connellsville is nice because they have in there, there is a campground there and they have in addition to campsites, some Adirondack shelters. And also the camp area is really well located near a grocery store. So you could actually, um, you know, not do your shopping for your groceries until you got there, which means then you don't have to haul them on the train. So that's a nice option. <laughs> but those are some, um, some ways that you could do some practice camping. Also, there are other trails in the Pittsburgh area. I have done um, single overnighters on the Montour um, that if you just wanna practice your packing and not ruin the fun of seeing the gap, it's uh, a very similar trail where you can Get some practice camping in. So, um, and when I mentioned, and when I brought up Dravo, I said, like, not right now. Um, I mentioned it on the attachment that um, was shared, but there are a couple of um, trail alerts right now, and um, you do want to stay aware of those. CNO is really good about putting out their trail alerts. Um, the gap sometimes can be a little more hit or miss since there isn't one main organization. But the two things going on on the trail right now, there is the trail is actually closed in the Buena Vista area just on the other side of McKeesport. Um, it is scheduled to reopen on April 30th. There have been there's been no communication as to whether that project is running on time or not. So you want to be alert to that because um, those projects can run over. Um, at this point, there is no detour recommended for that area because the roads in that area are not great. So there was no official detour named. Um, there are reports that people sometimes have been able to get through, but it's just a really ruddy, bumpy ride and it counts on, you know, the construction workers saying, yes, we're working off the edge, you can go or not. So it's kind of hit or miss. At this point, your best bet, if you were starting a trip before April 30th, um, or depending on if they delay the, the finish, um, is having, is starting on the other side of it. Um, you're gonna lose 20 some miles, but they're the 20 some miles on this end where you can see them anytime. And it's maybe just have a friend drop you off at a trailhead on the other side of that. The other project right now is at the Pawpaw Tunnel. This is a multi-year project. As of now, the trail is actually open um, and they're working around it. Um, however, it could close at any time. Um, and because of that, they have a detour posted at all times. Um, the uh, detour is actually a walking detour where you're walking up over 
over the hill that the tunnel goes through. It's about a mile and a half and they recommend about an hour to an hour and a half because you are pushing your bike over a hill. Um, so that's just, that detour is always available though. So those are the two, um, two big alerts that are going on right now. Yes, the, um, the 10 mile stretch around Boston, that is the same as the Buena Vista, McKeesport um, closure. They're saying 4.30 now, uh, but we don't know if, that's, if they're actually going to be ready at that point. So that's just one we have to watch, so. All right, I think one more question we have here in the chat was from Amanda. Are there any groups in the area that might, might be able to help link people to travel together that might not be comfortable traveling solo without having to go through a tour company? Um, I don't know of any specific, uh, specific groups. Um, I know that like on Facebook, there is a local, uh, Facebook group called adventure biking. Um, that might be a place to that, you know, that's a local group. Um, that might be a place where you could, um, make connections like that. Um, I really, think that the um, Facebook group that, you know, that we're in here might be another place that we could start making those connections, but I don't know of one that already exists. Yeah, I agree. I think because of COVID, a lot of places aren't organizing more of those kind of like structured trips um, that might be, you know, hosted by a non-tour company, but um, like Dory said, there are tons of Facebook groups. Um, I just listed some here in the chat, like Black Girls Do Bike, Women's Weekly Road Rides, Fork. Um, I'm sure there are people in all of those groups and the Women Non-Binary Facebook group. Um, that's actually what inspired this workshop was because people were looking to make a trip um, and looking for recommendations. So I'm sure there are plenty of other individuals in your shoes. Um, if they're not here attending this workshop right now, they're in those groups. So um, I would say start a thread and yeah, find, find your pals. Um, I know we're a little bit over time, so I just wanted to uh, say a couple of things in case people have to hop off to their next Saturday plans. Um, Thank you, first of all, Dirty, for hosting this amazing workshop. Um, so incredible. So many helpful resources shared today. Um, I would say if you're interested in attending future workshops like this, uh, definitely check out our Women on Binary newsletter. We'll be posting upcoming events um, like our Bike Anywhere celebration and, uh, like I mentioned, the How to Fix a Flat workshop um, very soon. So there's more in the works. Um, but yes, thank you again so much. Um, I will be sharing this recording on bikepgh.org as well as uh, the awesome resources list that Dirty put together. Um, but yeah, I guess if there are any more final questions, uh, Dirty, you can answer those or we can connect in, on Facebook, whatever you're all feeling. <laughs> Yeah, if there's any other questions, I have a few minutes more that I could answer them or you could I'm in the Facebook group, you can feel free to reach out and ask me questions that way. <laughs>